All right, everyone, we're going to get started here. Um, I want to welcome everybody to Naturalist Nights. Um, my name is Ben Sherman. I'm a winter naturalist here at ACES. Um, naturalist Nights is a 10-week free speaker series um, in the Roaring Fork Valley hosted um, by a partnership between the Wilderness Workshop, Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, and the Roaring Fork Audubon. Um, these talks are hosted each week through mid-March um, in Carbondale at 5.30 and here at ACES at 7 p.m. on Thursdays. Um, cycling through should be tonight's um, Naturalist Night series sponsors. Um, we'll see them come up in just a little bit here. Um, those are lots of our generous sponsors. Um, and then a special shout out to tonight's featured sponsor. Um, it's Craig Ward with Aspen Snowmass Sotheby's Interna um, International Realty. Um, we'll see it coming through on a slide in just a moment here. Um, these businesses provide financial and in-kind donations, um, which cover travel expenses for our speakers and provide um, the money that um, goes to Grassroots TV for recording these presentations, really making Naturalist Nights possible. Um, Grassroots TV airs these presentations on Channel 12, Up Valley, and Channel 82, Down Valley. Um, these videos will also be available for um, viewing later on on our website. Um, next week's presentation will be Dr. Scott A. Taylor, and his presentation will be Guarding the World's Finest Guano, <laughs> a story of ecology and economy. Uh, should be a cool presentation. Um, but I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, um, David Anderson. Dave is a natural historian who works with the full spectrum of Colorado's conservation community in order to support informed decision making in our state. Um, as a biology major at CU, Dave became interested in alpine and arctic plants. He went on to study the ecology of arctic plants in the Canadian high arctic and in graduate school at the University of Washington. Um, after grad school, he and his wife joined the Peace Corps and taught middle school science in the Solomon Islands. Not long after their return, Dave began working for the Colorado Natural Heritage Program, or CNHP, um, first as a botanist and now as the director of the program. CNHP supports sustainable conservation and management by keeping track of rare species, plant communities, wetlands, and protected areas throughout the state of Colorado. CNHP provides this information to a range of partners to help them make well-informed conservation decisions. Um, CNHP also creates a variety of models and tools to help support conservation. It is an honor to welcome Dave to our 2018 Naturalist Nights. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, thank you all very much. It is really a tremendous honor to come here, um, to be invited and, and get to talk with you about Colorado's natural history. Um, something that I know all of you are very interested in and uh, excited about. And um, it's a particular honor to be part of a speaker series that involves a talk especially dedicated to guano. Um, <laughs> that is beyond cool. And I am going to watch that talk. Um, it is going to be interesting. Um, so uh, the presentation that ASIS has asked me here to uh, uh, to give uh, was uh, taken from a talk I gave for the a plenary at the Natural Areas Association conference um, in October uh, about Colorado's natural history. So I've modified that talk quite a bit to try to infuse uh, local elements of natural history into it um, for uh, the Roaring Fork Valley and the area that we're in to try to bring it home a little bit. So there's a lot of both in here. Um, and I've, I'm also going to talk a little bit about some things that we have going on here um, that uh, the Colorado Natural Heritage Program is working on here in, in the valley. Um, so uh, this is the title that goes on the playbill for my talk, The Life and Times of Colorado, Our State's Natural, His uh, Natural History. And um, like many of you, I bet a lot of you um, have loved old natural history texts 
and they uh, are lots of fun to read. They're full of flowery language, um, you know, back in the, the last couple of centuries of natural history writing. And, and this is the document is the Natural History and Antiquities of Selborne in the county of Southampton, to which are added the naturalist calendar, observations of various parts of nature, and poems. <laughs> That's an awesome title. And so I decided to create a real title for my talk that doesn't fit on the playbill in honor of these kinds of titles. So the actual title of my talk is The Natural History of Colorado, wherein is contained the whole discourse and description of the landscape, its history and changes over time, and the species occupying this region, their relationships to each other and manner of assembling into repeating patterns on the landscape, particular noteworthy taxi, and stories of leading explorers, and a poem. <laughs> so, um, so to, to, taking that apart, it's kind of going to look like this. We're going to we're going to talk about what natural history is, which is particularly relevant for this series of talks. Um, and we'll, I'll go over a few things happening in the valley and kind of how our program supports those things. And then we'll delve into the deep history of Colorado, looking at its geology, ancient climates, its beasts and landscapes. Then we'll uh, explore the present and the future uh, natural history of Colorado, uh, looking at some key ecological systems of Colorado and the denizens thereof the changing face of Colorado. And then we will not talk about dead white guys, and we will also not have enough poems. <laughs> so here we go. So what is natural history? And this is a question that I became really interested in when I was asked to speak about the natural history of Colorado because we are a natural heritage program. So. I was like, I really should know what the difference between these two things is. And it's an interesting distinction between natural history and natural heritage. Natural history is a really time-honored tradition of observation-based information about plants and animals, the places they live, and the ways that they interact. And that's kind of boiled down from the Oxford English Dictionary's definition of, of that term. Um, and so the emphasis there is on observation. It's very focused on the collection of information from the natural environment. It's not so much experiment-based um, in its purest form. So natural heritage is a concept that um, we believe started with Lyndon B. Johnson. He's the first person we know of who have, who's coined this term. And it refers to the nature that we have inherited from our forefathers. Um, so um, it, it thinks of natural history in terms of, of our inheritance and in terms of our responsibility to take good care of it and pass it on to future generations. Um, and so it was first used by Lyndon B. Johnson, then by Jimmy Carter, and it was really embraced by the Nature Conservancy. And at that time, in the 1970s, the Nature Conservancy established the whole network of natural heritage programs. There's a program like mine in every state and in all of the Canadian provinces and territories and in 16 Latin American countries. All of us are united under a nonprofit called NatureServe. We all work together, we use similar methods, and all of our data get rolled up together so that we can look at natural history across um, the scale of a, a municipal park all the way up to a hemisphere, um, you know, and or the globe. So it's, it's, a, it's a cool thing that, that kind of came out of, of this thinking. And some of the programs, the, the natural heritage programs, don't all have the same name like ours. Some of them have natural history in the name because they focus on documenting natural history. So just to kind of boil down a little bit about what we do, um, we uh, um, take, pay attention to what species and communities, I'm sorry, that's kind of redundant. We, we, we um, document what species and communities we should be paying attention to. And we use scientific data on what we know about these species to help determine what their conservation priorities need to be. Because um, we have limited conservation dollars, we need to put those on the ground in the most effective possible way. So our programs help identify what the rare species are, what should be listed endangered, what should be sensitive, what don't we have to worry about. Um, we also pay attention to where these targets of conservation are located um, because we can't do effective conservation if we don't know where our um, bio elements of biodiversity are. And we keep track of how they're doing. So this is a map here showing uh, 
all about 30,000 locations of rare animals in red, plants in uh, green, and, and uh, um, plant communities in blue. Um, sorry, animals are blue, plant communities are red. And um, we have information on how all of those locations are doing and can rank them along a, a continuum of uh, conservation status with that information. And then um, th the last key thing that heritage programs do is identify what places and landscapes we should be paying attention to because um, most uh, people who are uh, decision makers find it very difficult to focus on things at this level. But um, we can look at, at big landscapes here. These are Col uh, Colorado's potential conservation areas. These indicate the very best places for us to focus on biodiversity conservation. These are opportunities for us to save nature. And so the pink ones that you see in this map here are um, ones that are of uh, extremely high biodiversity significance. They, um, there's about 40 of those in Colorado and those pink areas indicate places where a particular species is kind of making its last stand. That's a place where if we don't manage for a particular species, we're quite likely to lose it. So that's kind of what we do uh, at, at, a, at the grand scale at Colorado Natural Heritage Program um, and at all the other natural heritage programs. And here's something that uh, we've uh, been talking a lot about with people in our community here. Um, this was a biological inventory we finished in 1999 in which we identified 55 of those potential conservation areas and 77 species of concern were found when we did that work. And uh, 10 of those sites are of very high biodiversity significance. So the Roaring Fork Valley is a pretty important place for biodiversity conservation. This is what that map looks like. Um, we know that this has gotten kind of dated now. Um, we need to revisit this map and uh, uh, help, help define uh, the, the important directions for uh, conservation moving forward in, in the Roaring Fork Valley. And um, so uh, it uh, takes a lot of work to survey an entire county. So what we've done to uh, make that a manageable enterprise is to look at the habitats very carefully for the target species and narrow down the landscape to where we really think we're gonna find rare species when we do a project like this. Um, so this was kind of a, a start. Um, we're, we're planning to take this another step forward, and I'll tell you about that in a second here. But currently, uh, the projects we have going on are to help the Pitkin Open Space and Trails add more uh, information to the um, Pitkin Outside website. So you're gonna be able to drill down much further into uh, data and information about each of the Pitkin Open Space and Trail sites through this enhanced website that we're helping them out with. Um, we're also doing bio blitzes. This coming summer will be the third year that we've done bio blitzes on a ranch near uh, Carbondale um, called the Spring Valley Ranch. It's adjacent to the Spring Valley campus of CMC. And um, we're also doing a lot of bat surveys and monitoring with Colorado Parks and Wildlife and, and the White River National Forest. There's some really amazing bat populations here in the Roaring Fork Valley. We're just over the hill um, working in Lake County this past couple summers and this coming summer doing inventories of wetlands and uplands. Um, and we're about to get going on something called the Biodiversity and Connectivity Initiative. And this is an effort that's being channeled through a nonprofit that Tom Cardamone is standing up. Um, in this project, we're going to focus on connectivity um, of, uh, for, of habitats for deer, elk, bighorn sheep, and focus on some of the critical habitats for them, uh, in, which are gonna be aspen and riparian areas. And um, so that project, we're uh, planning to have on the ground this coming summer. Um, we're also going to be doing a survey of the South Canyon area, and uh, which is owned by the city of Glenwood Springs, just west of the city um, near I-70. And uh, some of you might have heard about this. I guess there's been some articles in the paper now about uh, the city's plans to do some developments and improvements in that um, 
on that property. So we're going to do uh, biodiversity surveys of that property to help make sure that they know uh, that they're empowered with the knowledge of, of their uh, natural heritage resources so that they can plan developments around those and help, help ensure that, that we don't lose those. Um, and then we're also talking about uh, partnering with ACES to do some bio blitzes on the ACES properties in future years, um, celebrating their uh, 50 years of success. So we'll, we'll see what we end up doing with that. That's very much been just a conversation so far. Um, and so the partners that we work with uh, on all of these projects are the, what make them successful because we're at Colorado State University based in Fort Collins. Um, and our program is part of the university, but we're funded entirely through um, uh, contracts, agreements, um, and donations to the program. And we work all over the state, but everything we do is, is entirely partnership driven. And the things that we do are meant to support people who are on the ground who are actually going to do uh, management and development and conservation, because our program doesn't do any of that. We're sort of a uh, decision-making support brain trust for helping people do good work. So our partners are where it all really comes together. And so we're working with uh, partners in the Valley and, and also um, these kind of statewide um, federal and state and orgs uh, that we've worked with on just about all of our projects somehow. So the biodiversity and connectivity initiative is um, coming up soon and um, and it's, we're doing that because of concern for wildlife and movement between seasonal habitats for those uh, large ungulates. And um, we know that uh, we have opportunities now to enhance wildlife connectivity in the Roaring Fork Valley. And we know that right now is the ideal time to do something about it because conservation efforts are only gonna get more complicated and expensive as prices increase and more people move here. So um, this is a good opportunity right now. And that in order to put conservation on the ground effectively, we need to identify the best possible options for connectivity. Um, where do we still have some connectivity that we can protect? Where do we have missing connectivity that we need to create? And that might even look like something like an overpass or an underpass under Highway 82. We don't know yet. Um, and we acknowledge that we all want to live in a place that's optimal for people in nature. I mean, why do we live here in the Roaring Fork Valley? <laughs> I mean, that's why we're here. That's what makes it wonderful. Um, it's what really makes all of Colorado wonderful. So, um, and that's, that's what we're just trying to help with at, at Colorado Natural Heritage Program. So um, the way that all of this starts, you know, data and science are where everything begins in conservation. And so um, we have to document biodiversity um, first. And th so these are my young daughters venturing forth to do that, um, using tr tr the traditional tools of the trade. And, and uh, <laughs> they, the, yeah, Mia's not very excited about it at this time. But, um, but these are the exact kinds of tools that we're using at the Spring Valley Ranch Bio Blitzes. And I wanted to feature that with you a little bit because uh, the ranch owner, John Powers, um, wanted me to invite the community to this event this year. Um, so we're, he's, he's really interested in having people from the valley come and, and see his ranch and, and help us discover biodiversity on that ranch. And if you're interested in doing that, I brought a pile of my business cards, or you can write down my email and shoot me an email. And then as I start to figure out when this is gonna happen, it's starting to look like May is when this will happen. And I can get in touch with you and uh, help connect you up with things. So um, the reason we're, that we're doing bio blitzes is uh, to conduct a rapid study of a particular property um, will, um, a bio blitz is done uh, over the course of a day or two or three um, and during that time you try to find as much biodiversity as you can and it's a really great way to engage people in conservation and connect them to the land and so we are inviting experts 
to help us identify things, um, students to learn and community members to learn and, and tell us and share their knowledge of, of the um, natural history on these sites. And so we're really interested in, in the learning, outreach, connecting, and inspiring parts of doing a bio blitz and getting people excited about what they have in their neighborhood. Um, so this is a, a, something that you'll see happening. Uh, lots of people are doing bio blitzes. The National Park Service loves these. Um, and we're, we're involved in a lot of them throughout the state every year. Um, and so when you're documenting biodiversity, whether that be through uh, the kinds of uh, field research that our program does all over the state through a bio blitz or through citizen science, um, one of the most important parts of that are the natural history collections where um, we have specimens that uh, are used to give us a definitive documentation of the presence of a species at a particular site. And so this is the New York Botanic Gardens herbarium and it's institutions like these that we rely on to make those maps that I showed you to know where our biodiversity resources are. And there's uh, some important considerations for collecting uh, specimens in nature. And uh, this is the best example of it I know of in Colorado. This is one of our 21 native orchid species called Malaxis brachypoda. And this orchid has only ever been seen at three tiny populations here in Boulder, Jefferson, and El Paso counties. And I had the chance to do some research on this species uh, for the Forest Service several years ago. And I dug up all of the specimens I could find at institutions all across the country from Smithsonian to Colorado herbaria. And each one of these is a label from an herbarium specimen. And um, I ended up finding more squished Malaxis brachypodas in herbaria than have ever been seen on the ground in Colorado. So almost all the Malaxis brachypodas we know of ever having been in Colorado are squished in herbaria. So um, this is a lot of this happened back in the days when um, Mr. Audubon went birding with a little bird shot gun. And that it, back in the day, that's how we documented biodiversity. We, we blasted it and we dug it up and we squished it and we collected it. And we, <laughs> we still do that. And for goodness sakes, we need to keep doing that. It's super important. But when there's three individuals in a population, we need to just leave them there and document them some other way. So, um, but yeah, so anyways, the, the tools of the trade remain very much the same as we document uh, natural history. And here we are doing that um, uh, at some of the, at the BioBlitz event last year. Um, we have a Roaring Fork uh, Audubon Society um, member, uh, Mary and Maddie here um, out with us last summer. And this is Asa, a CMC student who came out with us. And um, that was good fun. So these tools work great. And all, almost all of the biodiversity that's been documented on Earth has been done this way. Um, but we have some new really nifty tools. This is one that we're hoping to put to work in Colorado soon. It's a thing called eDNA. And you can collect very trace samples of DNA from water um, bodies and detect species in them. You can tell if there's otters or amphibians or fish or particular species in a water body this way without ever seeing them. And it's really cool stuff. So uh, our, our, the power of our ability to detect these things is vastly increasing now. So, you know, we're, we're, now we're going to venture back deep into time and look at Colorado's natural history uh, long ago. And we'll start here with our truly psychedelic geology map of Colorado. Um, very few states have one like this. But uh, this uh, is because uh, we had the Laramide orogeny that rose the Rocky Mountains up from 80 million years ago to 35 million years ago. And that process exposed two billion years of geology, like half of the Earth's history is visible um, in Colorado. So it's pretty amazing um, that we have a state like that. And that really contributes to our biodiversity because it adds 
a, a tremendous variety of habitats that species can occupy here. Um, so that, that's, one, that's why there's so much biodiversity in Colorado, one of the many reasons. And so I, like you, I love the dioramas at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. That's the first place I go. So I recreated one for you <laughs> here. Uh, this is a, a diorama of the Jurassic of Colorado. And uh, this is done with meticulous detail. These are actually our species, um, Brachiosaurus, Allosaurus, a crocodilian, and our state dinosaur, um, Stegosaurus armatus, are in this scene because they lived here in Colorado. And um, I would encourage all of you to go and check out um, Dinosaur Ridge sometime. Next time you drive down to Denver, if you haven't been there, it's right where I-70 first hits Denver near where 470 connects. And um, it's a state natural area and a national natural landmark. And you can see remains of all four of these critters um, in the rock there as um, impressions from footprints and fossils. And it's such a cool site. They have a great museum. And this will make a mundane trip to Denver really exciting if you choose to go check this place out. I love it. And um, so then moving forward in time <laughs> to the Cretaceous period. Cretaceous was 145 million to 66 million years ago. Um, and so these are two of the classic uh, species of the Cretaceous period, the late Cretaceous, um, just before the Chicxulub event which was the giant meteor that hit the Yucatan Peninsula and wiped out the dinosaurs and all of the aquatic reptiles except for turtles that were extant during the Cretaceous period. And so here we have Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops. Um, we also have grass because the grasses evolved in the Cretaceous period. That was the first time we had grasses on Earth. So um, then, you know, so, you know, I, there are some kids here, and this is going on the internet, and I'm sorry about this, but it's kind of, <laughs> uh, but uh, these things happen when you give, give talks about Tyrannosaurus rex. And um, so you can see evidence of these two beasts at a place called the Triceratops Trail, which is in Golden. It's just a little bit east of Dinosaur Ridge. So you could make a whole little day out of this to go check out both of those places there. Um, really neat. And so then after that, um, there was the Chicxulub event that I mentioned. Um, and you can see uh, evidence of that um, at several locations around Colorado. And there's a really nice outcrop of the KPG boundary, it's now called, at Trinidad Lake State Park. And um, you can see the line in the rock where the um, all the ejecta and the parts of the meteor can be seen in, uh, in, in the strata there. It's really cool stuff. So, um, so after the dinosaurs went extinct, um, we're in the uh, period called the Paleogene, which was from 66 million years ago to 38, or I'm sorry, to uh, 23 million years ago. And uh, it was during that time that the modern flora of Colorado started to evolve. We still had redwoods in Colorado at that time, but we also, uh, as the um, inland sea was retreating and the, Mount, the Rockies kept rising, um, the climate really changed in Colorado and places started to dry out. And that's when things like ponderosa pine and a lot of our really desert shrubs started to evolve as part of this uh, madro tertiary geoflora. A great one thing to throw around at a party if you want to sound smart. Um, and... Uh, so another thing that happened during the Paleogene is uh, the La Garita event. And this is a mind boggling thing that happened in Colorado. And this big brown blob here is where the La Garita event occurred. This was the Earth's largest volcanic eruption ever. There is no other record anywhere in the geologic history of a bigger volcanic eruption. This thing's three times bigger than the um, 
giant eruption of Yellowstone that, that created the caldera that Yellowstone National Park is in. And Colorado, we never get credit for this. People are always talking about Yellowstone and the supervolcano. Well, we have the supervolcano in Colorado, um, but ours is dormant. We don't have cool geysers and stuff, so all right. But um, the La Garita event um, ejected 15,000 cubic miles of stuff in one cataclysmic kablooey, like that's huge. That's like a whole mountain range. And uh, you know, it, it, I tried to calculate this volume and it's something like 20 by 30 miles, one mile deep. Just wow. So that's a big volcanic eruption and the red stuff shows where um, there's volcanics left over from that. And so we have some of those right here um, in um, near Mount Sopris. There's some ejecta from the La Garita event. And um, so, and uh, during around this time, there were plutons that are um, magma coming up from the deep that uh, didn't actually break the surface that created the West Elk Mountains. So that was around the same time that, that our mountains around here formed, uh, some of them. So it's a pretty neat, pretty neat stuff. And uh, while we're on the topic of volcanoes, um, there's a much more recent volcanic eruption near here that you drive past all the time at Dot Cerro. I don't know if all of you know, but there is a caldera just off the highway right there. And that was only 4,200 years ago. So that's crazy because there were people around Colorado at that time, and it would be interesting to know if they saw this. Um, and that magma chamber that created that eruption is the same magma chamber that heats up the hot springs at um, Glenwood Springs. So it's still doing something. And if you, so if you want to see La Garita, um, you can go visit it at the Wheeler Geologic Area, which is another one of Colorado's state natural areas. And that's down in Mineral County. So we're going to leap forward in time quite a bit now from La Garita and go into the um, Pleistocene, which was um, a recent period, relatively speaking, of 1.8 million years ago to 10,000 years ago. And that's when we had a lot of Ice Age events in Colorado and throughout the world. Um, so in Colorado, the Ice Age really wrote a story on our mountains, all of our big cirques everywhere you go. You probably skied on some today. Um, our uh, remains of the, the Ice Age glaciers that, that um, carved out the big U-shaped valleys in Colorado. And um, so a lot of us know about that. But what a lot of us don't know is that there's all sorts of other cool Ice Age stories in Colorado. And um, this one's one of my favorites because I'm a botanist. And uh, this, this little thing called the Greenland primrose, Primula egalixensis, is a fairly rare primrose. Um, it's quite rare in Colorado. And it's sort of rare across boreal Canada um, and um, Greenland and Iceland. And um, during the Ice Age, we think that this plant was fairly common down in the um, United States, but um, when it was much colder. And then as the ice receded, the range of this plant receded back north to where it is now. But it stuck around in a couple of weird little spots in Colorado where we have these relic habitats that have remained very stable since the Ice Age and are still very much like it was during the Ice Age. And this is a really cool one. This place is called High Creek Fen. It's a nature conservancy preserve um, in South Park. And you can, it's open to the public and you can turn off the highway uh, there south of Fairplay and go check High Creek Fen out. And there's a whole bunch of other weird rare plants there that, um, and this uh, relict primrose. So, um, and, and of, then of course the Snow Mastodon site um, at Snowmass here is the best preserved Ice Age uh, ecosystem, uh, certainly in Colorado. It might be almost anywhere. Uh, it really is phenomenal in the degree to which all of the elements of the ecosystem are, are preserved here at the Snow Mastodon site. So we've got some pretty cool Ice Age stuff right here in our neck of the woods. So um, now we're going to 
uh, move forward in time to the present day, and we're going to take a tour across Colorado and explore our natural history from the eastern Colorado Plains biome through the Colorado Rocky Mountains biome, and then end with the western Colorado valleys and plateaus. And um, you know, this is the classic elevation diagram of Colorado that shows all of the um, tremendous uh, diversity of elevations we have from 4,000 feet to 14,000 feet. And this is why we just have so many more interesting species here than Kansas does. <laughs> so not to knock on Kansas, <laughs> but uh, so uh, starting out at the plains, uh, these are the two major uh, ecological systems of the plains. It's the sand sage prairie here. It's found on sandier sites and the shortgrass prairie. And the shortgrass prairie has um, uh, long been home to the bison, which is really the boss of the prairie. Um, and here they're being released again at the Soapstone Prairie Natural Area, which is north of Fort Collins, a few miles. It's a city of Fort Collins natural area. And if you're on the front range and want to see an amazing place, this Soapstone natural area is so cool. Um, and now there's bison there, so you can go and see the bison in their na native habitat. And it's pretty exciting stuff. Watching them thunder out of this enclosure was just uh, life, uh, a memorable life experience. Um, so on the plains, uh, we've got some areas that are pretty important for biodiversity conservation. And this is one at um, the Pawnee Buttes. And we uh, have identified a larger area around Pawnee Buttes that we've named the Fritz Knopf Prairie Potential Conservation Area. And we named it after Fritz. Uh, he's a scientist who studied uh, the birds of the shortgrass prairie for many years. He passed away just a couple years ago. So we, we renamed this after him. And these are a couple of the birds that he studied, the mountain plover and the McCown's longspur. And these are uh, fairly rare species of the shortgrass prairie. And, and so here's what Fritz figured out is kind of going on. Um, there's a kind of gradient across the shortgrass prairie of, of intensity of grazing. Um, and that is how the species there evolved because of the, the way the bison grazed on the prairie was that some areas were very intensely grazed, others weren't touched for many years. And so the suite of uh, grassland birds evolved to uh, live on, on different heights of grass, uh, areas with different heights of grass. So those two we just looked at, the mountain plover and the McCown's longspur, like places with really, really short grass. But there's a bunch of other species that like the grass a little bit taller. Um, also out on the plains, we have some uh, pretty cool animals. Uh, the, of course, the black-tailed prairie dog and the burrowing owl are the really uh, keystone species for the shortgrass prairie. The swift fox is a fox that um, is native to the, to the prairie, and it requires pretty large landscapes uh, for it to uh, remain viable. And then, of course, the lesser prairie chicken, which has just about gone extinct in Colorado. Um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife is working really hard to maintain a, a try to maintain a, a viable population of that species here. And then we have this. This is a threatened species um, uh, on the endangered species list. Um, it's called the um, uh, the Enothera coloradensis. And that one's found in wet, swaley type sites out on the plains, which is why it's so rare because there's not very many of those. And then we have places out on the shortgrass prairie that are truly mind boggling because people don't even realize Colorado is like this. This is in far southeastern Colorado, about an hour and a half east of Trinidad. This is a ranch called the J.E. Canyon Ranch that we first started working on in 2007 as part of a biodiversity inventory of southeastern Colorado that we got funded by Great Outdoors Colorado. And, um, the rancher who owns this ranch um, um, is a fascinating person. Um, his name was Jerry Winger. Um, he's, uh, if you've ever uh, played in an orchestra, um, you've probably seen uh, Winger on your music stand, and that was him. He owned this ranch, and he became really passionate about 
this amazing place, which really would hold up as a national park. Um, this is a, a 50,000 acre ranch with a Purgatory River going through it. And um, it has uh, an amazing uh, amount of uh, biodiversity. It has, uh, the river flows continuously there and we have uh, native, uh, there's only native fish of the plains in that reach of the river. There's no uh, non-native fish in the river there. Um, and lots of other really amazing things. And this is now a Nature Conservancy preserve. Um, so some of the things there, like dinosaur footprints, amazing uh, rock art um, from Native Americans who've been there. Um, this is a long-billed curlew, uh, rare uh, shorebird that nests on the short grass prairie. There's a resident herd of bighorn sheep there out on the plains. Um, we know they used to do that a lot more, but here we still have them. And so it's a pretty, pretty cool place. So we're going to leave the plains now and uh, go on up into the Rocky Mountains, our, the biome that we're in now. And uh, we'll start on the foothills. And these are three key systems of the foothills. The foothills shrublands, which you can see uh, all around Fort Collins where I live. This is a rare shrubland type dominated by um, mountain mahogany. And these oaked and mixed mountain scrubs, uh, shrub, shrublands are another system along with Zarek Tallgrass Prairie. And Zarek Tallgrass Prairie is really cool. It's full of rare butterflies. Um, so some of the rare plants there are, include um, the Bell's Twin Pod, an endemic species in, to Colorado, just to two counties in Colorado. This uh, federally listed Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse that only lives in front range streams. Yeah, so yeah, of course that's rare. And um, <laughs> And then, then this, uh, this is a, um, a gay feather that's really rare on the, on the front range uh, foothills. We also have an, a listed endangered butterfly, the Pawnee Montane Skipper, in these habitats. We have these really weird plants in the foothills that are woodland prairie relics. Long ago, um, the prairies were a little bit wetter and we had a connection of forest from the mountains to the Midwest. And so that was contiguous habitat um, for species that now occur in little tiny pockets in Colorado and are more common somewhere out in like Wisconsin or, or Michigan or, or Missouri or something. So these are a couple of those woodland prairie relics. Um, moving up in elevation, we start to get into uh, the ponderosa pine savannas and then the lodgepole pines. Um, and higher we have subalpine forest and and then alpine tundra and, and um, at various elevations we also have some really amazing montane grasslands and some of the a couple of the animals that our program's working on a lot are the boreal toad which is a uh, very rare toad that's suffering from uh, fungal disease that's attacking populations of it um, this toad is uh, only found at very high elevations it's the only a toad living um, at, at the high elevations in Colorado. And then the Townsend's big-eared bat, um, which has some very nice maternal roosting colonies here um, near us uh, along the, um, you know, down valley from us. And we're worried about this bat because of a disease called white nose syndrome that's been attacking bats on the east coast and it's moved west across the country and it isn't known in Colorado yet. So we're monitoring those bats to try to uh, observe what happens. And so right around here, we have a bunch of uh, rare plants that are found in the mountains. And um, this one, this Harrington's Pinstemon is pretty neat. Um, you can see this thing in June driving along I-70 um, right around Eagle. There's some nice populations of it right on the side of the road there. And if you look for these blue flowers, uh, you, you can probably see Harrington's Pinstemon on your drives on I-70. Um, you have to look really closely to be sure it's not Osterhout's penstemon because Osterhout's penstemon has stamens that don't come out of the flower. Um, Harrington's has stamens that stick out of the flower. So you have to, you have to pull off I-70 and that's kind of scary. So I don't, and definitely don't try to see that in the moving car. Um, that's, that's, a, 
there are botanists who try to do this. So that's not a good thing to do. But, um, but there's a whole bunch of others that are really nifty. Here's another one that was discovered um, at the first uh, BioBlitz we had um, at Spring Valley. Um, the good neighbor bladder pod is, has only been known from the area around Montrose, and it was just found up at uh, Spring Valley Ranch um, in 2016 as part of our bio blitz. So that's a huge range extension for that very rare plant. So um, yeah, it's fun to be a botanist and always be talking about things like bladder pods. Um, so uh, let's move west now into the western plateaus of Colorado. Um, a lot of those are dominated by pinyon juniper woodlands. Um, we have the canyon country that uh, has a tremendous amount of endemic species in it. And this is um, Uniweep Seep, which is uh, a, an alcove um, almost straight west of here where um, water is seeping out between layers of sandstone. And we have an amazing diversity of rare species in that seep. And then we also have um, some really interesting things like the black swift, um, here, which lives here at Rifle Falls. And black swifts only nest behind waterfalls. So that's a pretty tough go of it in Colorado if you only nest behind waterfalls. Um, they're not endemic to Colorado, but they, um, there, there are uh, several places in the state where they live, and Rifle Falls is one of them. And if you want to see them at Rifle Falls, uh, go there kind of later in the day, and you might see them come flying back into their nests. And that's pretty fun. So in the Western Plateaus, um, we have uh, some really endangered fish. These are the um, four of the endangered fish of the upper Colorado River Basin. These are big water fish that depend on, um, you know, that need to be in big rivers with a flooding regime uh, to remain viable. And the bony tail chub is arguably the rarest animal in Colorado because its populations are now mostly being propped up by hatchery efforts that Colorado Parks and Wildlife is doing. And um, then we have, this is one of my favorite rare plants, um, the parachute penstemon, penstemon debilis. It only lives at five little tiny populations near Grand Junction in spots like this. <laughs> and this is the slide that I don't show to the um, risk management people at CSU. <laughs> and so, uh, and then of course sagebrush. Um, our sagebrush shrublands of the West Slope are dominated by about three different species of sagebrush. And they are home to some very interesting rare species, including these two, um, which are the uh, um, greater sage grouse and the Gunnison sage grouse. And in and, and, uh, far northwestern Colorado, uh, we have a lot of habitat for the greater sage grouse. Um, and then down around the Gunnison Basin and farther to the southwest, barely into Utah, is where the Gunnison sage grouse lives. And um, these are becoming very rare birds, and um, they, they're, they face a lot of threats, um, mostly due to human impacts on the landscape. And so I wanted also, you can't really, you got to talk about wetlands when you talk about natural history, because in Colorado, they're so important. Only these hollow bars tell you the percent of our landscape that's occupied by those systems. And um, wetlands only occupy 2% of the surface of Colorado. But the colorful bars on this graph show you the number of species at risk that are known from each of those habitats. So the wetlands are vastly disproportionately important for conservation in Colorado because so many of our species at risk depend on them. And overall, 75% of all of our wildlife species depend on wetlands at some stage of their life history. So um, conserving that 2% of Colorado is of, of very high importance. And we're working on lots of wetland conservation projects at our program because of that. Um, and this is fun because um, it's weird, but these are all wetlands. And a lot of people are like, okay, well, where's the water? And in almost all of Colorado's wetlands, you can't see the water. And so this top left one is a fen in the White River National Forest nearby here. Um, and fens are ancient peatlands. They're another part of our Ice Age story. They're left over 
from the Ice Age. Um, and then we have a riparian area and a greasewood flat and then a, a wet meadow in the mountains. The other habitat that's really important for our biodiversity are the barrens. And the barrens are uh, sedimentary rock outcrops throughout the state. We have them on the west slope and the east slope where we'll, um, there are really lousy, crappy soils on these barrens and only a few plants can tough it out and survive on the barrens. So a lot of our endemic species are uh, plants that are specialized to live on shale barrens. Um, and so here in the valley, some of, we have a lot of minifi shale, uh, mancos and mancos shale, and we have rare plants on a lot of those outcrops. And these are some of them. Um, these two are on the endangered species list. Um, and this one's out west as well. Um, and this one's actually lives down by Pueblo. So, you know, you got to think about climate change now with everything, but our, we've uh, made this graph that shows uh, annual precipitation on the Y and um, annual temperature on the X. And the dots indicate these systems that we've just looked at and where their uh, temperature and precipitation intersect now. And in the future, uh, modeling this out to 2060, we think that these boxes are where that environmental space is going to exist that they, um, that those places are in now. So those systems are going to be existing in very different environmental conditions and we don't know yet what's going to happen to them because of that. So um, I, I wanted also to talk about the people of Colorado and I love this bumper sticker because pretty much everyone who has it isn't isn't really like I was born in Aurora and uh, I'm pulling musk thistles out of my garden that are probably more native than me because they've had more generations here in Colorado than I have so you know but um, we do have uh, a lot of people that have lived in Colorado for a very long time the Utes have been in this valley for a long time um, some of our other tribes are the Pawnee, the Cherokee, Comanche, Cheyenne, and Arapaho, and they were the tribes that were besieged at the Sand Creek Massacre. Um, and uh, before them, we had ancestral Puebloans living in the cliffs down by Mesa Verde and Canyons of the Ancients. We also um, had before them the Folsom people, and we have really good evidence of them having been here around 10,000 years ago. And one of the most famous Folsom sites in the, uh, in the whole country is near Fort Collins. It's called the Lindemeyer site, and it's at the Soapstone Prairie Natural Area uh, where the bison also are. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, go check it out. That's where they found a, um, a Folsom point jammed into the vertebrae of a bison antiquus, the extinct species of bison um, that they hunted back then. So pretty definitive evidence that they were hunting bison. So, um, uh, but yeah, that's a slam dunk case right there. Um, so um, that's even better than the, the glove, but okay, but we don't, we don't have to talk about that. Um, but uh, so, so I wanted to talk about some of my heroines, my favorite people uh, in the natural history world. And this is, uh, w one of my heroines, Alice Eastwood, a truly amazing person who was a botanist um, in the formative days of Colorado, um, who was born in Toronto, and she was raised in a convent by a priest who was a botanist, and he made her become really interested in botany, instilled a love of it in her. And in 1873, her father asked her to come out to Colorado. He was running a store and needed some help. Um, so she finished high school in, in Denver, and, um, and then her father did all right with the storekeeping and invested in some real estate. And that real estate investment allowed her to be able to live full time as a botanist and just go be a botanist all the time. Um, and at that time, she started hiking a lot and traveling around on the trains around Colorado. Um, she became renowned as a hiker. She joined the hiking clubs that were all a bunch of men and she hiked out hiked those men wearing a dress that goes down to here um, and is truly legendary as a hiker. She's 
Uh, one of the stories I heard is that she hiked all the way from Boulder to Granby one time. Mm -hmm. So she is an amazing uh, person outdoors, an amazing botanist. And she, so she, we have collections from all over Colorado made by her where she rode the trains and would get off the trains and collect there at the train stops. Um, so and she was such a good hiker and such a good naturalist that she was asked to take Alfred Russell Wallace up Gray's Peak when he came to visit. He's the co-discoverer of evolution along with Charles Darwin. So she um, uh, ended up uh, moving out to San Francisco to become the curator of the um, California Academy of Sciences Herbarium. And during that time, you know, as she was, um, when she got there, she published this popular flora of Denver, Colorado. And she became the editor of the journal Zoe, which was a natural history journal um, that came out of the California Academy of Sciences. And um, so Alice has a deep, deep legacy here in Colorado from the great work she did. And a lot of species are named after her because of that. She described a lot of species, discovered a lot of them, and, and got them named after her. So this one, Alyciella, is named after her first name, Alice. This is an extremely rare plant that's only found it on top of two mountains in the San Juans that hadn't been seen since 18, 1892 and got rediscovered in 2005. Really cool stuff. And Mimulus eastwoodiae is named after her. And this is a picture from uh, Unaweep Seep of that rare, rare, it's a, um, a rare monkey flower. Here's another one. If you want a good adventure, go find this thing. Um, <laughs> Alice collected this in 1892 near Grand Junction somewhere. And the only one anyone has ever seen since then is the specimen that she collected. We don't know if this thing is extinct or it just hasn't been found yet. I'm betting that it, it's still out there and somebody has to go find where the little nook where Alice found it. Um, so that's a huge botanical mystery still existing in our state. So the reason that Alice Eastwood moved out to, the Cal to San Francisco was because of Mary Catherine Brandegee. So she is yet another amazing woman in, in Colorado's natural history story. And she was born in Tennessee and moved to California in 1849 with her family for the gold rushes. She was only the third woman ever to enter medical school in the University of California. And um, so she started working at the California Academy of Sciences Herbarium in 1879, and she was a medical student. Back then, you were also studying botany when you were a medical student. Um, so she married a guy named uh, Townsend Stiff around then, and they were a really great team and described tons of Colorado's plants. Um, they um, really moved botany forward in, in Colorado with their discoveries. and. Um, and then she uh, um, hired Alice Eastwood, and Alice Eastwood came out um, to curate the herbarium. And that's when Alice Eastwood really became famous because she um, was curating the herbarium in uh, the 1906 quake that destroyed the California Academy of Sciences. And at that time, Allison, Alice had innovated a new way to curate an herbarium. She had the idea that the type specimens, those are the ones that were used to describe a new species, that those should be kept in a special place. So she put them all in a special cabinet. Then when the quake destroyed the building, um, the, the building was barely standing and she, um, after the quake, she climbed in a window and climbed up the handrail to the sixth floor of the California Academy of Sciences. And she was able to yank those two trunks of those type specimens out of the cabinet and haul them somehow down the crumbling stairway and hauled them two miles over San Francisco roads going like this somehow and got them to safety. After that, the fire swept through and destroyed what was left of, of San Francisco in that part. So she is a true hero um, for having done that. Um, and uh, so, and Mary Catherine Brandegee is the reason that Alice was out there. Another one of our famous female botanists in Colorado is Hazel Schmall. Um, you'll note a pattern here. These botanists live a long time. So I'm hoping, I'm a botanist. I'm hoping that, that so, uh, but Hazel Schmall was, uh, she grew up in Ward, Colorado above Boulder. And her first 
job after she finished her master's thesis was to mount all of Alice Eastwood's plant specimens onto herbarium paper. And then she, uh, she was at that time um, working for the Colorado Historical Society. And then she did a PhD dissertation on the vegetation of Chimney Rock, which is down by Mesa Verde. And she, in her role uh, with the Natural um, Historical Society, lobbied for Colorado to have a state flower. And she uh, nominated the Columbine for that. So it's because of, Al of, because of Hazel that the Columbine is our state flower. And this rare milk vetch at Mesa Verde is named after, after Hazel, the Stragulus schmalier. This is the Chapin Mesa milk vetch, a very rare species there. And my last heroine that I wanted to introduce you to is my friend Jen Ackerfield, who is alive and well. She's <laughs> the, uh, the curator of the um, herbarium at Colorado State University. Um, she's, she um, started writing The Flora of Colorado in about the year 2000, and it was finally published in 2015. Um, in a, after a, a period of her life that was full of struggles and challenges, and I just, it's so amazing that she wrote this. Um, and uh, it is a beautiful flora, and I would highly suggest that you go and, and buy one. Uh, it's a great book if you're into plant identification. And so she's still our curator now. And so um, I did promise you a poem, and I want, I want to make good on that promise. So the poem that I want to share with you was written by Colorado's first poet laureate. His name was Thomas Hornby Farrell. And this poem is, uh, you can see this inside the dome of the Colorado State Capitol building. Um, and I've set it along with photos by a member of our staff named Michael Menifee. And I'll kind of close out this talk with this poem for you. Um, Here is a land where life is written in water. The West is where the water was and is. Father and son of old mother and daughter, following rivers up immensities of range and desert, thirsting the sundown ever, crossing a hill to climb a hill still drier, naming tonight a city by some river, a different name from last night's camping fire. Look to the green within the mountain cup, Look to the prairie parched for water's lack. Look to the sun that pulls the oceans up. Look to the cloud that gives the oceans back. Look to your heart and may your wisdom grow. To the power of lightning and to peace of snow. So thank you very much. That's Well, if anyone has questions, I'm happy to field those. Yes, sir. How long have you been doing your job? I started at Natural Heritage Program in 1999. So the job I have now, I've been doing for eight years. Before that, I was a botanist. And if so. you could hold your question until I can get the microphone around, oh, it'll allow people sorry. watching um, to hear what you've got to ask. <laughs> Thank you for that presentation. It was awesome. Thank you. Um, you had a graph of the the time and the precipitation expected with yes with climate change, um, and did it suggest that total precipitation was going to like increase? Does it kind of yeah looked like that? And I'm just there's curious. a pretty wide confidence interval around what we know about precipitation change in our climate models. So. Some of them say it's going to get drier. Some we expect it might get wetter. Yeah. Some it might get the same. In a lot of them, it might become more more variable and unpredictable. So that's it's pretty tough to know exactly what's going to happen. Thanks. Yeah. I have kind of a silly question, but uh, <laughs> as someone who has traveled to so many of Colorado's natural areas and uh, explored so many of them, like top two that you would 
recommend going out of your way to visit? Ooh, wowie. Yeah. <laughs> Top two. Well, yeah. Well, one of them, the, the place of late that has blown my mind more than anything else was the J.E. Canyon Ranch. Unfortunately, it's not that easy to visit it. Um, I don't know how one would go about doing that. would have to work with the Nature Conservancy to, to go see that place. Um, oh, boy. Yeah. My favorite one is always like the one I just went to. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, gosh, I think of all the wilderness hikes I've done and, and stuff around here and um, yeah, I love all of those. Uh, it's just pretty hard to pick one out of them. Uh, you know, in terms of places that, you know, to, that are really uh, just sort of mind bending kinds of, I think Soapstone Prairie Natural Area, I'd put that one on the list too. It's, it's just, it's so close to front range communities, but it's this amazingly uh, preserved place that, um, where you can really see, uh, see what the shortgrass prairie's like. It's, so I love that place too. Um, any yeah. last questions? How do we continue to protect these places when we've got an administration that doesn't seem to care about it? Stay active locally. You can do so much to advocate for conservation in your community. Um, I think, uh, you know, an ex an ex here in this community, there's so many um, nonprofits and conservation organizations that are doing great work. Um, and they are really how I think we can move the needle. And I think that can happen nationally, but it can happen right here in your community. And ACES is doing amazing things. And I think getting behind organizations like that is, gives me so much hope. Um, we'll do one more, if anybody has any questions. There was one in the back before. It was about the, is this working? Um, the Eagle Blitz, that's um, at the Powers Ranch. Yeah. So it's a one or two day commitment. And then is it also, I know that there's like ranching that goes on up there and there's like an art center. That uh, Is it kind of, I mean, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, I don't know much about the other things, um, but we are inviting landowners. We invited them before too um, from the area and really hope that they can come this year. Um, and the commitment can be just a few hours if you wanted to stop by. Um, it's easy to pop by and do a, a bird walk with us in the morning or, or something like that. So um, we, once we start to narrow that down, you can decide what you'd like to do. And please, if you're interested, take, take my card and, and get in touch. Um, we'd love, love for people to come out. So, okay, thank you.